in a Star Trek film, there's all these fantastic elements that don't exist in reality. Things that don't have sound. The, the, the bird of prey doesn't have a sound. The transporter beam doesn't have a sound. A photon torpedo doesn't have a sound. Those are all things that are made up with visual effects. They, they need sounds. They have to be created somehow. So in a very, very broad sense, the sound editor's job is to create, provide, edit those sounds in sync with the film so that you have a pleasing experience when you watch the film. So that when you watch the film, you actually believe that the thing that you're seeing is the same thing, is the thing that you're hearing, or the thing that you're hearing is the thing that you're seeing. Well, Star Trek IV was a little bit different in that Leonard was somewhat of a nut for sound, which is really a, you know, a godsend for a guy like me because he takes it so seriously. He wants it to be such an important, dramatic part of the film. The climax of the film, you know, the probe shows up and liberates the you know, the whales and, you know, everybody lives happily ever after. 99% of all films made in the world, that's accompanied by dramatic music. And Leonard, I think, very bravely and very rightly chose for that to be a scene that played only with sound effects. There was no dialogue and there was no score to say, here's what you should be feeling, this is triumphant, this is um, dramatic. It was all done with sounds that we fabricated. I had read the script, and I, I can't remember if there was, like, you know, text about... I don't think this... All the script said was, the probe comes, and the whales have been released into the ocean, and they have this dialogue, and everything's all better. You I mean, that's sort of what the script... But I didn't really get the scene. And, in fact, when I saw the scene, there were no visual effects. I came on very early, and there was no ILM shot of the probe yet. So I don't... I think I had slugs, which meant a placeholder in the film that they gave me that said, scene missing probe, scene missing whale. I said to um, Harv, I said, I don't think I really understand what's going on here. I mean, it's, I guess it's a conversation. I, I mean, can, can you help me out with this? And Harv proceeded to do a little, like, puppet show for me. He's, he said, and he, he, he did the dialogue for me. He said, now, Mark, what I want you to make is sounds that sort of approximate what I'm about to do. And he, so he does the probe. He says, hi, whales. Uh, what's going on? And then he does the whales down here, like under the water. Well, we're kind of unhappy because we're about to be extinct. Well, that's why I've traveled so far through space to come and see you. Is there anything that I can do to help you? Why, sure there is. And, and, and he go, goes on to like do this like really silly little you know pantomime of the dramatic conclusion of Star Trek IV. Now I had to go and make this happen with sound effects without using English. I had to create sound effects that imparted that to the audience without ever being able, we weren't gonna, you know, I, I may have said something equally as impertinent like, hey, Harv, can, can we subtitle this or something? No, 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 they'll get it. I promise you they'll sort it out. I think Leonard, had a, a sort of a, a closer association with the sort of the Star Trek cult. I think he understood it. And he, he, he knew that the Trekkies wanted to hear all those sort of goofy noises, the sounds of communicators and photon torpedoes. And that, that helped, uh, that allowed me to have a little more free reign with having fun uh, with the sound effects. When I came on on Star Trek IV, there had already been Star Trek's one, two, and three before them, and the sounds had been established for the feature film version of them. So, in fact, the transporter beam decloaking and cloaking of the bird of prey, um, photon torpedoes, to, to some degree had already been invented. Now, you know, look, I'm, I got an ego as big as everybody else's, too, and so, you know, I thought, well, I can't just take it out of the box just the way the last guy had done it. So I had to put my little spin on everything, you know. So I, I, I didn't have to, you know, reinvent the wheel. What I did is I invented the mag wheel. Somebody had already invented the round thing, and I just added the little bolts on it. <laughs> Must be the radiation. Leonard was one of those sort of dream directors because I think having come out of theater, and I'm not sure uh, fully aware of his, his whole background, but he, he was a director that respected all the artists, and he, I think he saw everyone in collaboration as an artist. And uh, what I enjoyed about working with Leonard was he was very clear and succinct about what he wanted, and then he allowed you to do it without a lot of micromanagement, which happens a lot in the film business. One of my fondest memories of Leonard is this, this uh, one sort of head-to-head, -head because the most crucial sound in the film is the sound of the probe. <laughs> 
the sound of the probe actually traveling through space. There was a, a, the three or four components to it. There was this language that we talked about earlier. And then there was the sound, of, the sound that it makes when it's just sort of traveling through space. It's sort of V8 engine sound, if you will. I went through, boy, 12, 15, 18 uh, permutations of the sound. And I'd call Leonard in, no, nope, that's not right. No, nope, that's not right. And I, you know, oh, I'm going to get it. This is going to be really good. And finally, it's the 11th hour. We're at the dubbing stage. And I've, I've come up with my la latest, greatest, oh, Leonard, you're going to love this one, you know? And we get to the scene, and there's the probe traveling across the screen, and up comes my sound. And, there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of blank stares, Leonard looking at Pete the editor and Harv Bennett and Mark. It doesn't work. And I'm crushed. I've already designed, like, 19 versions of this sound. And you know, I have pride in my work. I have a big, as I've said earlier, I have a big ego too. And like, what do you mean? This is a great sound. Come on. And uh, it, I think I even said to him something to the effect of, well, Leonard, you know, if you're so smart, you know, you tell me what a probe sounds like. You know, I was being rather pert impertinent. And he makes this sound. He goes, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, that's so. And I, so I said to the engineers at the console, I said, Let's put up a mic. You know, I, I was like, kind of like really pissy. And it was late at night. I said, let's put that in a movie. I was sort of daring him. And he said, okay. So he hung a microphone. And, you know, he stands up to the microphone. And there he's like, and, and they, you know, hit record. He's like, blah, 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 blah. And that's what's in the movie. I mean, it has like, honest to God, it has like just the tiniest bit of dressing on it. And that's the sound of the probe in the movie. <laughs> As they're traveling through time, Leonard and I developed this concept that, that time would come in waves and, and sort of bang the whole, like as I guess they're going through warp four, warp five, warp six. I, I, we, six. we wanted to demark that with a sound, that like, you know, like burst breaking the sound barrier, which is Mach one or warp one or something like that. So I wanted to create the sound of this um, time wave approaching. And it was very simply banging on the dumpster behind our recording studio. We had this huge biker guy, you know, Harley Davidson, Hell's Angel kind of guy, literally just taking both fists on a, you know, a metal dumpster. And he he just, he just, you know, two fists just bang the side, and we put the microphones inside of it, and you got these huge, huge resonant metal. <laughs> and that, you know, you slow it down a little bit without a, a whole lot of elaborate processing. Um, that's uh, that's the sound of the, the sort of the time warp crashing on the hull. Steady as she goes. Warp four. Warp five. The sound of the probe talking to the whales was simply processed whale talk, and that was a good part of my job. I wanted really, really authentic um, humpback whale song. So um, my brother actually lived, still lives down the street from Roger Payne, who's the most notable cetacean, God, I'm going to get this wrong, biologist. So we sent him to Roger Payne's lab, and Roger spends his career recording and quantifying and you know, categorizing whales, humpback whales, that's his specialty. And he has a huge library of whale song. And now, you can't just go out in a boat and hang a microphone and get whale song. It wasn't something we were about to embark on. We wanted somebody who does this professionally. So my brother spent hours in Roger's lab looking for sort of just the right lilt of humpback speech uh, because we wanted real authentic song for the humpback whales when they spoke. And then we took that and processed it electronically for the whale, the probe portion, as I spoke of earlier, speaking to the, that whole sort of, hey, how you doing, whales? Uh, you know, oh, we're doing fine now. What's going on? You know, so we to, then took real whale song and edited it, you know, massaged it piece by piece electronically to fit the sort of um, envelope of human speech so it would feel like talking. <laughs> There's what we call the peel away, where they're on the bridge of the Enterprise and they're hearing the probe and these weird sort of squeaks and squawks and uh, sort of devolving that or deconstructing that sound back to whale song. So we had to sort of lift our skirts in a sense and get from this weird squeaky electronic sound to whale song and show 
you know, all the steps along the way because Uhura goes through this fun sort of little mad scientist thing, deconstructing it. I think I have it, sir. And this is what it would sound like underwater. Yes, sir. So if you're a sound guy, you got to hear, oh, that's what Mangini did. I see how he did it. Uhura did it for us. That's not a space age console. That's a synthesizer she's got there. I, I think what's, what, what I think is fun to remember as uh, when you go to see the movies, especially a movie like a Star Trek, is that so much of that world is fabricated. And if, you've, if, you, ha if, you, were, if you were transported, no pun intended, during the watching of a Star Trek film, it's because everything worked, and it didn't, you never stopped once to think, oh, did a guy make those sounds? You know, if you believe that somebody was transported, or you believe somebody was shot with a, you know, a, a phaser or something like that, it's because some nerdy guy like me was in a studio goofing around with synthesizers and weird sound effects and made something that was so believable that you bought it as that reality.